Are you glad to be in the house of God? Some of you are, are definitely can you believe we are moving into the summer? What an amazing time. The seasons are changing. Aren't you glad for that? You know, personally, I, I love the spring. I love the fall. I like it when it's warming up. Maybe wear a jacket. Not too hot where you're sweating all the time. Not too cold where you can't feel your toes. Come on, somebody. I mean, there's been times in the morning I take my dog out uh, early in the morning and think, is it ever going to warm up? Have you ever had those moments? During the wintertime, oh God, it's so cold today, again, and tomorrow again. When is it ever going to change? And you get that feeling that things don't change, and it does. We don't have to do anything. It does. But you know, in life, there's things that we deal with that sometimes seem permanent. And if you stare at the problem long enough over a period of time, you can almost adapt to the idea that it will not change, that it's going to be there forever. It might be a, a debt that you're trying to deal with. It might be a, a, a family issue or a child that's running astray, and you're kind of looking over their, their life and thinking and praying and saying, God, is this ever going to change? And in those moments, if we're not careful, we'll begin to adapt and to adopt to the situation as if it's never going to change. Camp out, if you will. You know, Israel, when they left Egypt, when God brought them out of slavery, over 400 years of them being in bondage, over 400 years of them praying, over 400 years of them waiting, over 400 years of them looking for the Messiah, and when God sent Moses to, to be the deliverer of his people, and God does the impossible, God broke the, the powers of the impossible, the most strongest nation. Are you listening? He... That Egypt was at its time the, the most powerful nation, the richest nation, the controlling nation of the known world. And they, the most powerful nation in the world had control, had complete dominance over God's people. And God said, let them go. And they said, no. Has the devil, devil ever told you, no, I'm going to be healed? No, you're not. One day I'm going to be blessed. No, you're not. My life's going to be better. No, it's not. And as you look through the story, and I encourage you to do that, God dealt, utilizing Moses, he dealt with every idol that they worshipped. Do you realize that? That when God told Moses, I want you to do this, and there was a curse that come, and it might have been on the water, it might have been on the, the, the animals, it might have been whatever area it was, it wasn't just a random thing, it was literally gods that they prayed to. So they prayed to a God that would keep their water pure and clean. And God said, okay, I'm going to deal head on head, one on one, head to head with this one. And every time that it would, you would think Pharaoh would begin to say, let him go, God, the Bible tells us in a very interesting reason, the Bible says that God would harden the heart of Pharaoh. Do you hear me? Yes. God would harden the heart of Pharaoh. Why? Because he wasn't done destroying their, their gods. Because when his people was getting ready to walk out, he was going to leave no doubt that it was the God of heaven that destroyed every God of Egypt. And they, the Bible says when they walked out, they walked out with the gold of Egypt. The, the, get it, again, the richest nation on the earth. They walked out with back pay. Come on, somebody. They walked out with overtime pay. They walked out with everything they were due, plus, plus. Amen. But not only that, the Bible says that every, there wasn't a feeble or sickly person amongst them. God says, I'm not only going to deliver you, I'm going to provide for you, but I'm going to bring healing and strength back in your body, because i got to take you somewhere that I can't leave you dragging behind everybody else. We're going somewhere. We're going somewhere. We're going somewhere. See, I'm a firm believer when the Spirit of God begins to move upon you, that the things that would try to hold you back, God says, if you let me, I'll deal with it one, head to head, one on one, because through the covenant of Jesus, because he wants to take you somewhere. You're going somewhere. You can't stay in the pit of the problems of the past and expect to reach destiny. God wants you to do something. He wants you to speak something. He wants you to hear something. He wants you to make things known. He wants you to subdue kingdoms, Hebrews 11. He wants you to shut the mouth of lions in the, in the lives of people, Hebrews 11. He wants you to reach people that you might not be able to reach without him. Amen. You're called to do something. Yeah. You're called to make a difference. Yeah. You're, are you listening to me? Yeah. 
This is not even in my notes, but it's in my spirit. You are called to make a difference. If your life is about praying just so you have enough to get by and match everybody else, your prayers will not be answered because your prayers are not aligned with the word of God, for he watches over his word to perform it. You start praying in a line with the word of God. Oh God, I know you've called me for bigger things and better things. And I thank you that as I walk this thing out, I'm getting stronger every day. Not just for me, but you've called me. I have a covenant of healing, 1 Peter 2, 24. But I also know that destiny is still within me. Destiny is still upon me. Destiny is still ahead of me. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to back up. I'm not going to forget. I'm not going to become like everybody else. You're not called to be average. You're not called to be average. You're not called to be average. You're called to be supernatural. The Bible says in the New Testament, a peculiar people, which means not weird, not odd, but a people that the average can't understand because you're cut above the rest. Not in arrogance, but in the demonstration of God's goodness and grace in your life. Can I get an amen? amen? And so, God delivered Israel. He brought them out. But when he brought them out, the psalmist said, he, you brought us out into a wonderful place. God never does one side of the coin. He's the all-sufficient God. He completes it all. It's all done. When you got saved, he just didn't purchase you with the blood of Jesus for your spirit person. No, he wants also your mind, your will, and emotions, and your body. That's why the Bible says that at the last great trumpet call, that everybody who has died in the past will come out of the graves. Every person, I don't know how they died. They might have been blown up. They might have been cremated. They might have just gone into the I don't know how it all works out. But I know the word of God says when God makes the last call, for his people that even if every atom is broken down into molecules that we don't even understand biologically yet. If it goes down to the Higboson level and to the space they call the God space, I'm telling you, God has a way. He knows, he has identified. If he can number, if he can, you listen, if he can number and call out the stars that he's created by name and we can't even count them, every cell that you have, he has it numbered. If he's got your hair numbered, he's got every cell and he knows within the infinite wisdom of who he is because he is more than enough. He is the El Shaddai. He is Jehovah God and beside him there is no other and there is no other that can comprehend him. You can study him for a million years and never understand the goodness and the greatness of your God. That he has wisdom beyond measure and he knows everything about everyone and he has the ability and at their call he calls his people and even their cells, their atoms the most tiniest molecules will come to intention and come because he's purchased you by the blood of Jesus. You are not redeemed, which means bought back by corruptible things, the word of God says, but by incorruptible, by the blood of Jesus. God can do it. And he's bringing his people out. And he didn't just bring them out, he's bringing them into something. When you only work on, think on, plan on coming out, you miss out on what God has for you. Spend as much time, if not more time, on what you're going into as what you're coming out of. Even people that get delivered, Jesus said a strong man is safe and secure to the stronger than he shows up, and then he can bind him and take his goods. But he also goes on to say that after a period of time, that demon will roam through dry places. And after a while, if he can't find a home, he'll come back and look, and he'll look and see if that person he was cast out of is full or empty. And if he finds him empty, he'll go get seven friends stronger than him. And he will return. He will return. Some of you have been praying for someone to be delivered. Listen, if they don't want to be delivered, don't pray for them to be delivered yet. Because if they, it's more than just getting them delivered. you got to get them filled. Can I get an amen? You can make it worse on their life. If you force, you have authority over the devil, but you don't have authority over people's will. And so you got to make sure their will is in alignment to want to be free. I'm talking to somebody today. They have to want to be free because if they get free for a moment, the devil will try to come back because it's just not coming out of something. He's going into something. Man, I haven't even got to my notes yet, but we're warming up with something from the Holy Spirit for you today. Can I get an amen? And it's just not coming out of something. It's coming into what God has for you. He brings you out 
out into, out into. He brings you out of something into something. And when he sets people free, he brings them out of bondage, but he expects them to be filled with his presence. So when the enemy tries to step back, walk in, look around, drive by, whatever it may be, he notices that there is a sign that says no vacancy because you are filled with the presence of God. Don't let the devil trick you that all you need to do is get out of the pit. You need to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might because the enemy is, is there, John 10, 10, to steal, kill, and destroy. But you are called to win. You are called to battle. You are called to be victorious. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Rise up, child of God. You don't have to live defeated. You don't have to live broken. You don't have to live broken in pieces. You can be all that God's called you to be. Thank you, Jesus. So God brings them out, but he's bringing them into, where's he taking them? He's bringing them into his promised land, the place prepared. Hebrews tells us that many of them couldn't enter in because of their unbelief. Even though there was a place of rest, the promised land, that they could not enter in, Hebrews 4, because of their unbelief. They chose to hear the word, but they didn't mix it. And the Bible brings that even into the New Testament. The people can hear the word, but if they don't mix faith with it, it doesn't allow them to enter into what God has for them. Well, pastor, what does God have for me? I'm telling you that the promises of the New Testament that are tied to the covenant of the blood of Jesus, just don't go look for Old Testament stuff. Get into the New Testament. The Old Testament is wonderful. We can learn, but it's shadow and types of things to come. I want to see something with clarity. The Bible talks about that Jesus is the light. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you want to know the heart of the Father, look to the Son. And we need to go to the New Testament. What is this all about? What does God have for me? Oh, he'll he'll forgive your sins. That's a wonderful thing to have. He'll forgive you of all your sins to be free from condemnation and guilt and the depression that sin brings on your life. Sin will try to devalue you. Sin will try to destroy you. Sin will try to keep you longer than you want to stay and cost you more than you want to pay. But God says by the blood of Jesus, if you let me, if you repent, I am faithful and just, 1 John 1, 9, to cleanse you and forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That means that it, you've never sinned before because someone says, I remember you. You're the one that did this, not me. I've repented. That's behind me. It no longer is a part of me. That person is dead. I live a new life. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? You are free from the condemnation of sin. Not to go back into sin. Romans 6, shall we use our freedom from sin to live in sin? God forbid, Paul says. That means you're free from it, not to go back into it, but to walk above it and say the devil can't get a hold of me. Where do you get that? The Bible says that the enemy to Jesus, the enemy toucheth him not. And if the Jesus can walk in an anointing and Jesus can walk in covenant, then I can access the covenant of him because he said, without me, you can do nothing. But with him, you have authority, Matthew 18, 18. And if Jesus can walk with the enemy, he wasn't afraid of everything and anyone that the enemy would try to bring. Why? Because he knew he was in complete obedience to the will of the Father. Well, I'm not Jesus. No, you're not. But you're the body of Christ. And if you're born again, you have access to all that belongs to you through the blood of Jesus. If you believe that, give the Lord a clap of praise for the next 30 seconds. Say, I'm going somewhere. somewhere. Don't camp out at the problems of impossibility. Don't camp out at the walls of Jericho. No. Oh, no one's ever been healed or helped with that disease. It's killed every person that's got it. What do I do? You still look at Jehovah. You look at Jesus, who by his stripes, by his stripes, by his stripes, you were healed. And you let the doctor know that, get a good look of you. Take a picture, if you will. Because he needs to have a good picture of the first person that comes out of this situation who's fought the giant of impossibility. But with God on your side, all things are possible to him that believes. And you walk in saying, I believe. I believe I received. Mark 11, 23, 24. I believe that the God who healed me before is still the same God who healed me today. I believe that at that name, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. I believe what God said he meant, that no weapon formed against me will prosper and every tongue that that rises up against me in judgment, I shall condemn. For this is my right, my heritage, my righteousness is of him. 
It's not because of you. It's all about him. Amen. See, I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere. Let's get to our notes. We've been talking about the power of your testimony or the power of your story. Your story to share it. That it equips you, empowers you, and inspires others. But I know on the reality that they're in a large group setting like this, there will be people who have come out of a story recently and they are celebrating. But there's also people that just heard of a challenge and they, they got to get their eye that the, the roar of the giant is really a reward opportunity from heaven. That God didn't send the enemy, but what the enemy meant for evil, God will turn for good. And like David who heard the roar of Goliath, he said, what is the reward? Because he understood that if I go to battle for God, God will go to battle for me. And at the end of the day, what used to intimidate everybody around me, it only becomes an opportunity for me to go ahead, to come out better, to come out with more, not because of the problem, but because there's a reward when you fight the battles of God. Can I get an amen? amen. See, I'm going somewhere. I'm going you have a story. Yeah. There's people that are celebrating their story right now. There's people who just maybe heard of a challenge and they're going into battle. And maybe there's some here today that you've been in a battle for a length of time. What do you do when the journey of your story is taking longer than you planned? We've talked about the acronyms of it, and I'm going to end with the why today, and it means that you, you have a choice. The devil will try to negate you. If you've ever been in battle, the devil will try to tell you that what you say, what you do, it makes no difference. You have no control. Why would he do that? Because he knows he is the father of all lies, and Jesus said in him is no truth. He knows that you have a choice. He don't want you to know the, cho the choice. He's a deceiver. He's a deceiver. So he'll try to tell you that you, all your options are is to sit back and endure and just wait and just hope and just hope that God will do something, hope something better happens. Just sit back and just take it, just take it and just make it through it. But all of a sudden, the Word of God just stir on the inside of you. Wait a minute. I can have more than just I hope something happens. I can activate my hope into faith. And it, because faith is a substance of things, hope for Hebrews 11.1. 1. And all of a sudden, you can begin to activate your faith and say, wait a minute. My God is bigger than this. My God is more than enough. What do we do when we're on a journey? Because God was bringing Israel out of Egypt into the promised land. But it wasn't overnight. It was, was not overnight. I wish everything was overnight. I wish everything was immediate. I wish the moment you gave your first tithe and offering that the next day you got a phone call and it had a hundred percent return, hundredfold return, and you'd be like, wow, this is great. I'm going to do it again. Some of you are on your third week of giving, the devil messes with you and saying, look what you could have bought with that money. Are you sure God's going to work? Nobody likes the process of Hebrews 6 that tells us through faith and patience we inherit the promises. But one of the things you can learn is that what God is producing in you and he's going to work through you, it's just not a one-time fix. What God does, the Bible says, will come upon wave upon wave. And I'm telling you, when you cast your bread upon the water, when you cast the bread of life, the word of God, onto the, onto the natural, it will begin to produce. Isaiah 55, Isaiah 55, Isaiah 55, not just 11, but verse 10. It talks about forcing, bringing the natural, bringing the natural as rain and snow comes down from heaven and does not return, but waters the earth and makes it produce. When I'm casting bread on the water, I am casting to speak in the word of God to the natural, and it will, in the process of time, force the natural to come into alignment, not one time, not two times, but wave upon wave upon wave, because what God's producing in you isn't just the fruit, it's the tree that keeps producing the fruit, season after season after season. Do you catch that today? Yeah. You say, God, I'm hungry, and God wants you fed, but God's more interested than just giving you an apple to be fed. He's more interested in building an apple tree on the inside of you. Amen. So it's every season you can produce fruit. John 15, verse 7, 8, and 16. I have not chosen, you have not chosen me, but I've ordained and chosen you that you would produce 
much fruit, verse 16, and this is what gives glory to your Father. More than just you having, God wants you becoming. And in the becoming, you will have it. In the becoming. Oh, just help me to love somebody. God's going to teach you how to love people you hate. Some of you are freaked by that because you can't even love the people that you should love. Wow, what happened there? We just stepped in something all of a sudden. <laughs> Generosity is just not what you do on a Sunday. It's a rhythm of life. Right. But if you can't do it on Sunday, you won't be doing it in the rhythm of life. Right. Right. Fights one of the greatest giants of any Christian, any person deals with for Jesus said you cannot love. See, we're not taking a second offering, so just lighten up. Jesus said you cannot love God and money. Money is an important thing. Money is an important thing. Money should be a priority. I had somebody walk by, and they were young, young in life, young in, in their faith. Oh, you know, I really don't care about money. You better care about money. You won't have it. You don't have it. You can't take care of your responsibility of your family, nor can you help other people. I, it's not being spiritual, say, oh, I just don't care. No, no, it's a priority. But never let it become the number one priority. How you, if you don't handle stuff correctly, if things, things that you don't treat as important, you'll lose. Relationships, friendships, marriages, money, career, education, whatever. Whatever you, t- whatever you treat lighthearted as no big deal won't be in your life in 10, 20 years. It's just a reality of life. You need to treat things with respect, treat things that are important. Sh- you know what I mean? Just don't be flippant with the things that God brings in your life. But never... Never let important stuff become priority number one, because they all, all important things want to become priority number one. It's just the nature of it. It's just the nature. Your friends will be like, am I the most important person in your life? No. You're important. I remember my daughter saying to me one day, and I love her more than I love my own life. But I remember one day, Dad, do you love me? Absolutely. Am I the most important person in your life? Sweetie, you're not, and she was little. I said, no, you're not. Oh, about, I thought I broke her heart. I said, listen, your daddy loves you so much, but number one, I love Jesus more than anything. I said, and I said, number two, I love your, your mother. And I said, and you're number three. And, I, and she goes, third, I said, it's a pretty good place to be number three, I'm telling you. Thank you. It doesn't matter if it's your marriage. Your marriage will challenge you sometimes. That's right. Trying to see, it will challenge. Just with innately, within anything that's important, it will, I'm talking to somebody, I don't know who it is. In, innately, with anything that's important, you'll have moments that it will want to challenge the number one spot. Right. And you have to be willing to stand up and say, no, this is not acceptable. Right. Your career, your boss, well, if I don't, do, if I don't work on Sunday, I might lose my job. If you work on Sunday, you might lose your relationship with the Lord. I can always find a different job. I can't find another Jesus. Okay, I'll get back to my notes. I'll leave you alone. I'll leave you alone. So God's bringing them out. I don't even know where I am on my notes. It's just, I'm just, I, I glanced down. I'm not even reading anything on my notes. It's just, they're there. So God brings Israel out of Egypt in, into the promised land, but the into part takes some time, the patient yes. side. Yes. And it's in the into that it's so important because you have a voice. You don't sit back and do nothing and be idle. God, you, God empowers you with this thing called a choice. Yes. Do you realize that of all creation, you were the only one that has a choice? That's why you can repent. Angels could not repent. You were created the image of God. You have this thing called a will. And the devil hates it. Because you have a choice. You have a will. Which means you can make decisions. Even in the battle. Even on the journey. You have a right to speak up and be heard. But in journey, some journey, some 
journeys you might go through might take a little longer than we expected. Can I get an amen? amen. Well, you shouldn't say amen to that because that's, that's saying beat unto me. So we speak of the other going to speed up for you. Amen. But when you go, th- thank you, Ted. So, but when you go through, <laughs> but when you go through the process, when you're walking through to your promised land, it's important for you to understand that there's something for you to keep doing. The, and we can look and see by example and by principle instruction from the Word of God what we need to do in the journey. Well, I've been dealing with this for a year, three years, ten years. Can you believe Noah over a hundred years working on fulfilling the promise and instruction of God? Moses, Abraham. You begin, to, we in this generation, we want God to answer at a stopwatch. Go. And we think for us to get through the journey, we just have to take our hands off it, ride in the back seat, and let Jesus take the wheel. And if you've been here long enough, you'll hear me say things over and over again on certain areas because it's important for us to get get these in our spirit. Listen to me, child of God. Jesus doesn't want the wheel. Jesus doesn't want the wheel. No, Jesus gave you a choice. He'll never override your choice. He wants you to make the decision, but he wants you to make the decision to follow him. Right. He, wants to, for, he wants to be number one in your life, but he's not going to take the wheel, kick you in the back seat in the car of your life and say, sit there and shut up, and I'll let you know when we get there. Right. As you've said to your children, come on, somebody, right. on a long drive. <laughs> Quit asking, are we there yet? I'll let you know. So how do we follow God? How do we follow God in our journey? How do we follow God when we're moving out of something into something that's the promises of God? Because the promises of God to you are yea and amen, which means approved and so be it. And each one of those promises, you could look at it metaphorically like uh, the example of Israel, that they are a promised land you are moving toward. And we have to understand that God doesn't want you to camp out at the wall of impossibility. He wants you to begin to rise up and move forward. But there's times in your life that God will say, I don't want you to move yet. I want you to stay where you're at. And there's times that God's I don't want you to stay anymore. Pack up the tent and move. That's what he did to Israel. There's times I want you to wait. There's times I want you to go. How do you know? You start, you can get almost, uh, drive yourself crazy trying to figure this out. God, should I go? Should I stay? Should I stand? Should I sleep? Should I rest? Should I walk? Should I war? What do you want me to do? What do we do, New Testament saints? How do we know? Because if God didn't tell you to charge the giant, you don't want to charge the giant. And if God told you to charge the giant, you don't want to be at home waiting. I'm just waiting on the Lord. This is an interesting dynamic, a tension that every believer deals with in the New Testament. Because to make things even a little more curious, the Bible tells us that if you're a child of God, son and daughter of God, that we are to be led by the Spirit. And that, is, that sometimes has been so misconstrued. My prayer for you today is that when you walk out of here, you will have a stronger understanding of what it means to be led by the Spirit as we look to the Word of God and not be moved or motivated by the things around you. Amen. Amen. And here we go. That was just introduction. Some of you get nervous. You're going to look for lunch right now. Exodus chapter 13. This is how God led his people in the Old Testament. Verse 21. By the day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them. He just didn't give them a nav system. He just didn't point to where and say, here's a map I'll meet you there. He said, I'm going to walk this thing out with you. I want you to know that Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. Can I get an amen? I said, Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. Can I get a better amen? It doesn't matter if you feel him or have a goosebump or, you know what I mean, feel excited or feel sad. Ir- irrelevant of the what you feel, you have to know with absolute resolve that Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. He's with you in the journey. He's with you. Pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. And by night, a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or by night. 
Neither the, pow- neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. God said, listen, you, now think about that for a second. It never left where? In front of the people. All right, let me say this. Let me work with you a little bit. And this is kind of to throw you off on a side note that throws us off. If I was going to ask, if you ask most people to point toward heaven, where do they go? Well, if I go to China or to the Philippines where we have a lot of churches, and I ask them to point toward heaven, where do you think they'll point? But if the earth's circular, wouldn't it be just, okay, just messing with you. Some of you will get that later. And the, the cloud and the fire went where? Was always, always, talk to me, church. Always where? In front of them. In front of them is an interesting dynamic because I could say to you that my Bible and the podium and my iPad, that they are in front of me. Right now, they are in front of me. But the contingency for them to be in front of me is not just the responsibility of where they're at, it's responsibility of what I am focusing on. You see my point? They are in front of me. Now they are behind me. God said, I'm going to move somewhere, I'm going to go somewhere, and I'll stay in front of you. So when you stop seeing the direction of God, maybe it's not God stop moving, maybe you have... Because you have a choice. You have a choice. You have a choice. This is, if you walk away and think that it's all about the woo feeling, you, you're going to miss out. Because some people wake up and that everything's an emotional fault and they think that that's being led by the Spirit of God. I wake up to find out where I should go to church today. If that's you today and we, you're here, we love you, thank you for coming. But that's not the way it's supposed to play. Can you imagine waking up every morning? I'm going to wake up and see who God wants me to be married to. Yeah, you're going to go to jail soon. (laughs) I mean, that's just silly. Some people think following the Holy Spirit means no responsibility, no expectation. I don't don't like those demands. I just kind of go with the Lord. No, you're, you're being moved by your emotions and your imagination. I had a guy show up once years ago at the other location and I was asking where, where the pastor was, and someone happened to point towards me. And let me just give you inside track. If anybody walks in and they look goofy, and they say to you, where's the pastor? Don't point to me. <laughs> Come on, you got to have pastors back. You just don't point to me. I know what they're probably thinking. I'm getting rid of getting him off my back, and I'm going to pass him on. To... And so he walked over to me and said, you the pastor? And I said, yes, sir, I am. And he said, oh, I'm prophet so-and-so, and the Lord gave me a word for your people, and I wanted to see if I can get on the platform and, and share it. Now, I want you to notice something, and if you're a guest, listen to me. I believe in prophets. It's part of the fivefold ministry. They're still around. Now, there's not as many as around as, as people say. There's more people who call themselves prophet, prophets than people that God's called prophets. So there's a lot of nutty people in the world. But just because someone says it, again, remember last week, don't consider everything innocent until proven guilty. Consider everything guilty until proven. And and right in the moment, in the moment, the Lord just gave you the right words. And I'm thankful for this because right in the moment, I didn't, wasn't rude. I wasn't, I was real pleasant, which I always am, day or night, seven days a week. (laughs) Hallelujah. No, I, uh. But the Lord just dropped in my heart, and I said to him, well, you know what? The Holy Spirit didn't tell me you were coming. I don't know you from Adam, so you're not going to get near our platform. But I am so glad that you came. Why don't you just make yourself at home and enjoy the service? Because if the Holy Spirit told him, the Holy Spirit can also tell me. Still the same Holy Ghost, right? So this is not going to be about how to walk around and be weird. We're going to be real. Amen. Where was I? Okay. So the the Lord walked in front of them. And that's based on not only where where God's going, it's based on what you're focusing on. God doesn't push you from behind. The enemy pushes you. God leads. Israel wanted it. They prayed for it, but they had to still move toward it. James says faith without works is what? Faith without works is dead. 
And it's interesting that in their motion, in their movement, because they couldn't just say, okay, God, you got us out of Egypt. Wouldn't this place be good? Couldn't you just take this desert and just all of a sudden make a supernatural oasis? God, you're the God of all. You're the most powerful. You can do everything. You've created everything. Lord, just supernaturally create. You did it in seven days, everything. Why don't you just take a, take a 30-minute break today and just create us an oasis of promised land right here. God said, I've already, basically, I've already, already created you a place, and I'm going to walk you to it yes. with you, but I need you to trust me. Yeah. Doesn't the Bible says, trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding, right. and all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. He's not going to give you the to-do list. He's going to say, if, get your eyes on me, follow me, and I'll show you. Right. And so he began to walk them out into to the promised land. But they had to move. A lot of Christians, our New Testament, if we're not careful, we just sit back, maintain our routine, and we want God to back up the truck. Lord, bless me according to your word. And God said, I not only want to bless you, I want to make you a blessing. Because if you're not faithful in the little, you'll never be faithful in the much. In fact, the Bible tells us the New Testament that if you cannot be faithful, which what belongs to you, how can you be entrusted of treasure that belongs to somebody else? Come on, come on. We pray for the anointing, but we, oh, we'll leave it alone. I get back, I get back. So they had to be, listen to me, they had to be in a mindset ready to move at a moment's notice. They, can you think about that? God said, I'm gonna, I moved you out of an impossible situation. I'm going to move you to an incredible situation. Amen. We celebrate that. Uh, but then a lot of times we're like, I'm going to rest and camp out. Bring it to me, Jesus. And Jesus said, no, we're going somewhere. But no, I want you to bring it to me, Jesus. I'm, I'm, I've already prepared it. We're going somewhere. Look to your neighbor and say, we're going somewhere. Have you ever wondered if what is hindering you is not the enemy creating a wall of impossibility? Could be what's hindering you is your own nature of wanting to stay where you're at in a comfort zone of familiarity, not willing to step out of what you've not done before because you want God to bring everything to you under the con uh, consignment of how you see things. Lord, here's my construct of how I see life. Bring it to me in this space. Numbers chapter 9, are you still with me? Yes. Verse 17, when the cloud lifted, the Bible says that the gun put a cloud over the tabernacle and would lead them, guide them. But when the cloud would lift over the sacred tent, the people of Israel would break camp and follow it. And wherever the cloud settled, the people of Israel would set up camp. But the day or night when the cloud lifted, the people broke camp and moved on. Day or night when the cloud did what? When the cloud lifted... It was time to move. When the cloud lifted, it was time to break up camp and begin to move. Whether the cloud stayed above the tabernacle for two days, a month, or a year, the people of Israel would stay in the camp and did not move on. But as soon as it lifted, they broke camp and moved on. Notice something. It wasn't scheduled out and a convenient thing. God would say, it's time to move. And they were instructed when the cloud would move, Begin to pack up. We're moving. Yeah. Lord, can you come back tomorrow? Not tomorrow. Now. Right. And as long as he stayed, they would continue doing their responsibility. Lord, we've been here for a while. Can we move on? Not yet. In following the leading of the Holy Spirit, being led by the Spirit, we don't have this, this cloud that we see in our natural eyes. But we have something uh, spiritualized. We have the ability to understand what the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding. Stay with me. I'm going to make it where it doesn't sound a mystery, but can be practically understand that you know that it's time for you to move. Yeah. I've seen too many Christians make the wrong decision because they move for the wrong motivation. Yeah. Right. They move because someone hurt their feelings. They, they move because the boss chewed them out after they've been late for three days. They move because the weather's changed and they're feeling gloomy. They didn't know how to interpret it. They move because someone didn't say hi to them. We're not just talking about church. We're talking about in general life. People will make major decisions in life and move for these things, and then they will blame it. It's, it's the most interesting thing, in my opinion. Then what I, they do what I call reverse engineer it. Do you know what I'm talking about? 
they'll do it for an emotional reason, but by the time they get to tell somebody, they'll have already articulated a plan how it becomes a spiritual reason. Oh, the Holy Spirit's just leading me down this road. Well, maybe God meant for this to happen because, no, no, you messed up, you got it wrong, it's okay to repent, repent, step up, get moving. Dust it off, get the dirt dusted off you, and begin to move forward. Don't try to spiritualize everything, don't spiritualize your mistakes, don't spiritualize your sin, you're not perfect, no one expects you to be perfect, no one's going to dog you for not being perfect, no one's perfect but Jesus, be real with yourself, and if you don't get real with yourself, you can't learn, you'll begin to spiritualize everything, because your focus is more on your appearance than your progress. You care more about how people see you than you making progress. Come on. Hmm. In 1 Kings chapter 17, God is speaking to the prophet Elijah. And he said, drink from the, the brook and eat what the ravens bring you, for I have commanded them to bring you food. So Elijah did as the Lord told him, and camp besides Kareth, Brook, Kareth, east of the Jordan, the ravens brought him bread and meat each morning and evening, and he drank from the brook. Now notice something, the ravens. Ravens are not a generous type of bird. So I mean, God can move upon anyone to bless you if he wanted to, right? And I've had people jokingly saying it. You can see that the similarity, basically it's like ravens are bringing them a hamburger every day, twice a day, right? Bread and meat. Now, you have to wonder, where in the world are ravens getting this? Because you would think, is that another animal? But a lot of theologians believe that what was happening during that time frame, that the, the king was an idol worshiper, and one of his idols that he worshipped was the raven. And he would have an altar that he would sacrifice food on the altar to the, the raven god. And the raven birds would come pick it up. He thought it was being accepted. God was using them to bring what he was offering to their god and bring it to feed to his people. Just a side note. Just thought you might like the interesting. But now notice the story, because this is where I want to key in on. Verse 7, but after a while, say after a while. After a while. You understand seasons can change. But after a while, the brook dried up. The brook dried up. The brook dried up. For there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. On a side principle, anything you just withdraw from without making a deposit will eventually dry up. Yeah. Back to relationships, education, career. If you're only drawing from it and never investing into it. That's why I encourage, if I ever advise and counsel people starting businesses, never give up your full-time job to start a new business. Your new business is like a baby. All the money that may, is made from your new business needs to go into the business. doesn't need to be paying the Ameren ut utility bill. It needs to be going back into the business so that it can grow, just like any baby. You don't put a baby to work. You, know, you feed the baby and let it rest so it can grow. Do you see my point? So anything, it's a principle of life. If anything you just withdraw from without ever making a deposit, it will, in the process of time, dry up. But this is the, the case that we're looking at for the prophet's perspective. Notice what happened. God was providing, and all of a sudden, the provision that God was using dried up. Now, most of us in our New Testament world, nobody here, let's say most Christians in the New Testament, New Covenant world, when the water started drying up, you know what they would have done? They would have moved on. The moment it became difficult, they would have moved on. And the problem with a lot of Christians is they think being led by the Spirit is going to the place of least resistance. Yep. And being led by the Spirit does not mean going to the place of least resistance. Right. If it does, then I have a lot of problems with the Old Testament and New Testament stories about men and women of God who went into battle facing Goliath, talking to the, the walls of Jericho, who were thrown into the fiery furnace. Oh, do you see my point? They, you know, they can, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and saying, you know what, King, we're not going to bow our knee to your idol. We're, we worship only our God. Well, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace then. 
Well, you know, I don't think God would want that to happen. We need to go. It's a little easier. Let's take the easier route, and let's reverse engineer this. Oh, you know what? We could reach a lot more people if we just bow our knee a little bit. No one has to know. Let's just do what the king wants us to do, and God will understand because he knows that over the process of years, we could help more people alive than we could dead. Come on. Come on. Mm, sounds good, don't it? It's amazing how the enemy can get us to rationalize disobedience. Being led by the Spirit doesn't always mean the easiest route. And some, some Christians, nobody here, they'll reference being led by, oh, the Holy Spirit led me. The Holy Spirit le didn't lead you. Usually it takes me five, sometimes ten, but usually five minutes after a few questions, I can get zero in to what's really true It's being said because most people don't tell what's really true. They hide that, and they put so many blankets of layers of reason and emotion above it that it takes a while to get those layers off to get to the real heart of it. What happened? Oh, I just think it's my time. It's, you know, the Lord moves it. What happened? Well, you know, I said, then it was kind of, what happened? No one invited me to the prayer meeting on Wednesday nights, and I just heard about it from the side, and I thought I should be the most one. But... Oh, your ego's hurt. Okay. <laughs> let's let's, let's, let's kind of softenly tap your back of your hand, you super spiritual person, you. Sometimes people who think they're super spiritual are the, sometimes the most emotional. And it's not because they're spiritual. Spiritual people doesn't mean that they're emotional people. Emotional people sometimes just think that they're spiritual people. And there's a difference. And that's why the Word of God is alive. It's active. It separates the soul and the spirit. It separates that. It brings right to the heart of the situation. And the Word of God can bring a change into our life so that we can learn that if we feel it, doesn't mean that it's from God or we should move by it. Because the Romans tells us that men and women of faith are not moved by what they feel here or see. If the well dries up, if the creek dries up, if the brook dries up, stand your ground trusting God. I'm not going to move until God tells me what to do. You know, my boss, he walked by me and didn't say, that's the third time he's walked by me. I, I think it's probably my season for me to get a different job. Okay. But after a while, the brook dried up. Notice Elijah <clears throat> the prophet did not, Elijah did not do anything at this moment. Verse 8, then the Lord said to Elijah, go and live in the village of... Now notice this. If he could have and would have moved before, he would have been moving on his own planning and not knowing that God was preparing a place for him to go. I'm not saying don't make major decisions in life. We have to learn to make decisions. We have to learn to get up and move when God says get up and move. But sometimes we're not moving based on the direction of the cloud. We're moving by the direction of our outside emotions. Right, right. But my sheep hear my voice. This does not mean, listen to me, this does not mean that you're hearing voices. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Can the Holy Spirit speak to you as if you're hearing a voice? Yes, yes, yes. But if you look for voices, the devil will accommodate you with confusion. The problem is people get a little bit, it's like you're in third grade and you want to get to 10th grade and you want to skip all the math in between. And when you get there, it won't make any sense. You have to walk the process out. And if you don't know the word of God, then you won't need to be prepared to hear the voice of God because the Holy Spirit always, in, always speaks in line with the word of God. And if you can't obey the written word of God, you'll never obey the spoken word of God. So instead of trying to look spiritual or pretend to be spiritual, get into the word because what you need to look for is the light of the truth of his word. And in the process of time, your spirit man can be developed through prayer and the study of the word. And you can grow where the Holy Spirit can speak to you that way. But it doesn't start off that way. You don't start off that way. If you go to a gym and try to bench 400 pounds, you're going to walk out in a hospital gurney because it doesn't work that way. You don't just start that way. You don't just get on a marathon and say, ooh, that's cool. I want to look like them. And you just get out and start running a marathon. You're going to be huffing and puffing and maybe in a hospital later because it doesn't work that way. you got to grow and develop your spirit person. And most people are like, oh, I just want to, I, it, it sounds so cool. And it looks so, so really, I get a lot of people be impressed with me if I can say that I hear the voice of God. Well, you can do that. And all of a sudden, if you you're not prepared and grown in the things of God, all of a sudden you won't be hearing the voice of God, you'll be hearing other voices. Because the Bible says the devil can appear as an angel of light. Right, right. 
I had a letter, about 25 years ago, a guy wrote, wrote a letter to the church, not even a member of the church, all mad at God because he said, well, God told him to marry a prostitute and he got a disease. Well, God didn't tell him to marry a prostitute. The moron. People will do the stupidest things and blame God. I'm telling you, you should hear some of the stories I have to deal with, so. Nobody from here, hallelujah. Then the Lord said unto Elijah, go and live in the village. Near the city of Sidon. Notice, he told them the village, the city, for I have instructed a widow. God had already been dealing with a person to resolve that. Which would be a miracle for her and for him. God had it all set up. It's not always, being led by the Spirit is not always following the easiest path, the path of least resistance. Elijah didn't move until the Lord had spoke to him to move and gave him direction, destination. We just want to move out of motion. God moves out of destination. He's a strategic God. Amen. You serve a strategic God. Yes. Be determined not to be moved by situations around you. Well, I'm going to get a divorce. My husband hurt my feelings. Wow, how many times do you want to be married? (laughs) Say, I'm not moved by what I feel, hear, or see. I'm moved by the word of God. Isaiah Isaiah 55, 11, notice this. So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall shall not return unto me void, but shall accomplish that to which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For you shall go out with joy and be led forth with joy. Let me talk to you, church. How do I know when the Holy Spirit is moving me to make a decision? Not when the emotions change, but when the the peace that's in your spirit changes. And that peace comes from the revealed word of God. As that word goes forth, it will not return void. Where is it? It's moving. And if you're going to move with it, you're going to be led with peace, not with pressure. Not with pressure. This is where the the growing phase happens when you're a baby Christian to a teenage Christian to an adult Christian. I remember years ago, and I've shared this before, years ago, I was uh, the pastor of the church, and the church at that time was going through a season, financial got a little tight. And I found myself, I wasn't wasn't trying to be negative, but you know, it's those moments that you, people ask you something and you're not prepared. It's it's one thing to get the answer right to the question when you know what's coming and you're prepared for it. Those we get right. It's those little small subtle ones that someone asks you when you're not even thinking about it and out of your heart. Right? Have you noticed that? Out of the abundance of your heart, Jesus said, your mouth speaks. Right. Jesus said, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Right. And I begin to become a little critical, a little negative, a little on, on this area. I wasn't trying to do anything major. I didn't think it was a big deal. I didn't think it was just small little comments I might say if someone brings it up. I know nobody here's ever had to deal with this. And in the process, one day I had a day off and I was running errands and my wife was was running errands too, but I was, was coming home, I was by myself at the time, I went through and got some fast food, and it was during the middle of the day, and I, my plan was I was going to turn on the TV, I'm going to eat some food, and just kind of chill out, and then begin to start prepping for the weekend. Was it no spiritual, no deep, I began to walk into the kitchen, and as I walked into the kitchen, my thought is, I need some ketchup for my fries. How deep is that? And yet, when I was in the kitchen, as God is my witness, and this does not happen to your pastor all the time. This is not a daily thing. Don't let people, people that tell you they've been to heaven a thousand times are lying. I'm just telling you, there's a lot of weird stuff out there. I've been walking on the streets of gold every weekend. No, you're not. You're high half the time, probably. I don't know what your problem is. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, some of you might know, but it, it's just, it's, it's, we can't, we got to balance everything. Do you see the difference? And so I was walking into the kitchen, minding my own business, and as God is my witness, I just found myself caught up in the presence of God. How do I know? Without, it wasn't a thought of raise my hands, but I found myself standing there praying in the spirit deeply with my hands raised and just caught up in the presence of God. It was the, one of the most unique experiences. And I heard the Spirit of God say to my heart, if that's all you can handle, that's as far as I can take you. 
I don't know about you, but that's, the Lord has a way and knows how to jerk our chain a little bit. When you walk this out in line with the word, a come to Jesus meeting is sometimes a good thing. If this is all you can handle, this is as far as I can take you. And out of that, I walked away with the perspective of learning when I face problems that seem to be intimidating. Out of my mouth, I say, no big deal. And I've seen God bring this church and ministry to a different level. If I would have stayed with the mindset, then I, it's not that God doesn't want us to go to the next level. Sometimes our own words, our own actions, our own choices are hindering us. I jokingly tell him, it's the truth. Some people, they don't need a devil. They don't need a demon to mess with them. Just let them sit by themselves for long enough and they'll self-implode. They'll say their own things, mess it up. They will create, I mean, they'll cause catastrophe everywhere with their mouth and their actions and decisions. They don't need a devil. In fact, I think the devil probably tells the demons, whatever you, stay away from this person. Why are they all annoying? No, it's not about that. Just if you get involved, you might get them all focused. But if you don't, if you stay back, just watch them. They'll, they're going to kind of start spinning on themselves. I'm just being real. Is this okay? Yeah. Be led forth with, with peace. God leads you with peace. The Lord will guide you through the revelation of his word. Philippians 3, verse 15, last verse. And let the peace, soul harmony, co which comes from Christ, rule, act as an umpire continually in your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your minds. In that peaceful state to which, as members of Christ, one body, you are also called to live. Let me read that again. And let the what? The peace. Notice that. Let the peace, soul harmony. I don't know what verse they got up there, but that's not right. Let the peace, the soul harmony which comes from Christ, rule, act as an umpire continually in your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your minds. When questions, when you're on the journey of life, when you are on the journey to promised land, when you're on the journey, guess what? Questions will still come up. I wonder if I'm still doing the right thing. I wonder if God still wants me to do this. I wonder if God really has me have. So the questions will arise. And what does the Bible tell us to do? Let the umpire of your soul, the peace of God, be the umpire and settle with all finality every question arise. What does that mean? That when you're in the journey of life and the presence and the peace of God is lifted. Okay, Lord, something's not right. What do you want me to do? Sometimes it's, I want you to pray for somebody. Sometimes it's, look around, you need to be out of that space. You don't need to be there. Sometimes it's, a decision's coming up, you need to be prepared, prepared for it. I don't know, but you, when you move out of a place of peace on the inside, the, the, the reason this becomes difficult for some is because during the baby infancy stage, they think peace is, let's all get along. And that's not the peace we're talking about. We're talking about a peace that's in your spirit, not in your emotions. When you understand this peace, you can have this peace in your spirit, your innermost being, and there can be turmoil and war around you, but on the inside, you're calm and at rest. Because you are believing that what God said. Now, if this doesn't make sense, put it on the back burner. Please don't try to jump ahead. Put it on the back burner and let the process of God uh, develop you in this. Because in the journey, when the clouds lift, when the peace is lifted... You need to pause. And as God directs you and reveals, why? Because when he shows you what to do, he'll give you the peace to go along with it. And with that peace, you know you also have the grace. You, you have the ability. You have the power. You have his will. You have his blessing. You have his provision. What are you doing? You're just going to the promised land. It doesn't look any different. I know because you might be walking through a desert, but you're not following what you see by the natural eye. You're following what God has revealed to you through his word by his spirit. For eye is not seen, ear is not heard, neither is entered the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for those who love him, but he has revealed them to us by his spirit. By his spirit. By his spirit. He reveals, he reveals the word of God and gives you peace. Do you see my point? Don't be moved by someone hurts your feelings. Stand your ground. Having done all the Bible says stand. There's time to stand. There's time to charge. There's time to shout. There's time to pray. 
What do you do? You follow God. How do I know? Am I looking for emotion? No, not a uh, physical emotion, but you're looking for the direction of God. And if you step out wrong, you ought to just pray, Lord, if I miss a step, show me, because I do not want to take a detour right. from your destiny. Right. You're the one that makes the decision. You're the navigator of your boat. And it's learning to find the mind of God and let him guide you. Because he will never leave you nor forsake you. Aren't you glad? We're done. Go ahead and give the Lord a hand clap of praise if you receive anything. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here today and do not have a real relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm not asking if you know about God. I'm asking you this question. Is Jesus Christ real to you today? In a way that you know for yourself that he's real and your Lord and Savior. With no one moving around, every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here and say, Pastor, I know about God. I know about the Bible. But personally, I don't have a real relationship. Revelation 3 says, I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice and open up, I come in. What is that? Give him an opportunity. Give him an opportunity. Give him an opportunity. And watch what he and only he can do in your life. This is not a religion. That's man's rules to get to God. It's a real relationship based on the word of God. If you don't have that relationship, today's your day. God does not have any grandchildren. He only has children. If you want to know him and you don't, if you want to come back to him today, pray this prayer from your heart. Say with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I turn to you today. I repent of all my sins. I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He came to this earth in the flesh, died on a cross for my sins, was buried for me, and on the third day rose again for me. Because I believe that, I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart, wash me in your blood, forgive me, cleanse me, Say, Jesus, I open up the door of my heart, the door of my life, and I invite you in to be my Savior and my Lord. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen.